Women's Prize for Fiction shortlist. Let's have a look, shall we? Vanishing Half, Piranesi, Unsettled Ground, Transcendent Kingdom. Now the one answer is to sweeps the house. No one is talking about this. Okay. So on further reflection, hello, my name is Ben, on further reflection, I think my response to the shortlist was um, kind of dulled by my disappointment that the transition baby wasn't there. But um, having taken a step back and um, looking at it, I think it is a an interesting list. Um, so we have Vanishing Half, which I've read and which I really loved, um, which is there, which is kind of like, kind of, you know, everyone thought that that was going to be there. Uh, same thing with Transcendent Kingdom, which I haven't read, but um, that seems like a strong contender. Uh, and then we have uh, Piranesi, which I've read, um, and I had some criticism with it, but um, you know I still enjoyed it. And that's kind of like the outlier fantasy, um, uh, yeah, sort of like very very specific genre fiction pick. Uh, and then for the last three, we have Unsettled. I haven't read any of these. We have Unsettled Ground, which from what I understand is kind of like a um, poverty set in rural England story. We have How the One-Armed Sister Sweeps a House, which is sounds like a very, very bleak um, uh, story set in Barbados. And then we have... Um, what's going on here? Then we have uh, No One Is Talking About This, which I think is the one that has kind of um, knocked... DB off, off the list because um, yeah, because I haven't read it, but it sounds like it is um a very, very modern, very edgy, confrontational um book, which is kind of what, although it's very different subject matter, it's kind of what Decentization Baby is, um, and they're both by white Americans, so um. So yes, but they've obviously tried to make the shortlist as broad as possible in terms of genres and in terms of the stories and in terms of the authors. So I think, um, yeah, if any book, um, if there was any book on there that had kind of knocked DB off the post, I think it was no one is talking about this. Um, sort of a shame that Burnt Sugar isn't there, but that's kind of understandable. Um, the only other surprise, I think, is Luster. I think everyone thought Luster would be there, but it's not. Um, but yes, but no, I'm, I'm happy with the, um, with the shortlist. Um, I was disappointed with the Edition Baby not being there. I think that would have been really exciting, but, you know, it is now a bestseller and it was longlisted, so that's fine. And, uh, yes, I'm going to carry on with, uh, drying my hair and, um, here's the rest of my wrap-up. Okay, so first of all, uh, I read The Sorrows of Young Werther by Goethe, and then straight after I read The New Sorrows of Young W by Ulrich Plensdorf. So these two, these were a, a buddy read suggestion by my friend Giovanni. Um, uh, we had previously read... Where is it? We'd previously read The Tower uh, together, um, and this was, um, yeah, he, su he suggested this buddy read because these two are like really, really short. They're like 100 pages, basically. So yeah, I'm kind of, I'm wanting to get into more 18th century fiction, um, and this was like a good, well, yeah, good starting point. Um, and also it was a good sort of like literary exercise, you know, to sort of read, you know, 18th century novel, then straight after read 20th century novel based on based on it. So first of all, well, first of all, um, just to let you know, I can't talk about this book without giving away an end of book major spoiler of this book. However, um, it is a spoiler that's given on the back and it's kind of, it's like the thing that people know about the book. So like, you know, it's like synonymous with Romeo and Juliet, you know what happens at the end it's sort of, it's known what happens at the end of this book. But if you don't, like I didn't, then um, you may want to skip to the next, to the third book that I'm going to talk about. So this is, it's kind of like the, 
the OG Holden Caulfield. Is that fair to say? Um, yeah, it's like a young man who believes he's a genius um, and everyone else is a, a, a big old phony. And yeah, he falls in love with this young woman who is already engaged and uh, she gets married to this other guy and he gets more and more kind of like, oh, I love you. Um, and she's like, oh, but I'm married. Sorry. And she sort of humours him and stuff and he gets more and more kind of overwrought about it all and then ends up ending his life over it. So yeah, so apparently this was a huge, huge kind of um, cultural reset, um, particularly with the young men of the day. It's apparently one of, if not the first sort of big international bestseller fiction book that sort of happened. Yes, it's it's a uh, it's sort of a, a a very important text, <laughs> the Sturm and Drang movement. So yeah, it was it was kind of um, revolutionary in its day because. It was a young man who was really um, sort of wearing his emotions on his sleeve, as it were. And then also it was kind of the way he kind of interacts and um, responds to nature, kind of wild nature. Uh, this was when people were like, no, nature should be left to be nature and wild and stuff. It's a great, I want to quote this page because I think it's fabulous. I felt as if I had been made a god in that overwhelming abundance, and the glorious forms of infinite creation moved in my soul, giving it life. Immense mountains surrounded me, chasms yawned at my feet, streams swollen by rain tumbled headlong, rivers flowed below me, and the forests and mountains resounded. And I could see those immeasurable and incomprehensible powers at work in the depths of the earth, and above the earth's surface, beneath the heavens, there teemed all the infinite species of creation. Everything, all of it, is peopled with myriad forms. And then mankind comes, building its nests, crowding together safely in little houses, and supposes it rules over the whole wide world. Poor fool! Imagine, imagining everything to be so small because you yourself are so small. Yes, no, I, yes, I like that. <laughs> uh, yes, yeah, so I, I like that. And so that's kind of what um, Werther is by Goethe is like. Um, he's kind of very kind of like, oh! So I have to say, I was reading this kind of with... I wasn't reading this as a novel. I was reading this as a literary kind of exercise because I think reading it as a novel, I was kind of like, this is... I'm a bit kind of worried about this. And my friend was saying, well, yes, I mean, from a modern kind of lens, um, we would... Uh, recognize Werther's by Goethe's um, kind of mania and depression and kind of treat it accordingly and yeah so it's it's an interesting one <laughs> it's interesting to kind of uh, read something that had such a kind of big profound um, uh, reaction to it um, and yes I was interested in it and then straight after that we read uh, The New Sorrows of Young W, of, uh, of young w by Plensdorf now this was written in the 70s, and this was written within kind of GDR times, within East Germany. I should say who these are translated by, so this is translated... Well, this is translated by Romy Fursland, and this edition was translated by Michael Hulse. I was a bit annoyed with, when this arrived in the post, because um, I wanted what the... I got this second hand, obviously, but um, I wanted the cover which had the kind of the guy kind of going... I wanted that cover, and... Um, and this sort of arrived, and I was like, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, so he wrote this in the seventies, whilst in the GDR, and it's it's kind of more interesting, kind of reading the the background to this book, and kind of the things that he had to change, because obviously this book ends in a suicide, um, and this book is kind of a bit odd. So the the narrator is kind of talking to us from beyond the grave, as it were. Um, so yeah, it's first person from someone from beyond the grave who has died from an accident. Because he is in the GDR, and because there's such a strict kind of, um, uh, you know, it's like the the, the very strict communist um, thing <laughs> of uh, of how you're meant to sort of behave, and he's and he's kind of um, yeah, he's wanting to break free of all that, and he wants to kind of be his own person and. Um, and he thinks he's a genius and he thinks he's a you know a genius painter when actually he's kind of everyone who sort of sees his paintings are like oh great um and yeah it's interesting kind of like the parallels but um but yes no this was interesting this was an interesting exercise um 
and I would, uh, well, I mean, if you're interested in sort of 18th century lit fiction, then I would sort of recommend this. Um, so yes, there we go. An interesting one. I'm old, Gandalf! Okay, next, so from 18th century Germany to 19th century Russia. So we have, I read, uh, I think this is how you pronounce it, Eugene Onegin. Is that right? I think it's right. Eugene Onegin. I'm sort of tempted to say Eugenie in a bottle, but we'll... only I think that's cute, and I think no one else will. So yes, Eugenie Onegin, hopefully. Uh, this is translated by James E. Fallon. And yes, so this is a, a novel in verse. The whole book is kind of, uh, yeah, these kind of 14 line stanzas. Um, there is a sort of specific rhyme scheme, but I'm not going to get into that. Now, I sort of had a bit of, I'll get to what the story is in a minute, but I had a bit of trouble getting into this book. So for the first 30 pages, I was kind of like, I'm really finding this hard going. And I kept having to re reread and reread bits and I just wasn't, nothing was kind of going in. I was like, what is going on? I was thinking that like, the rhymes were a bit weird and a bit cheesy sometimes. And I was like, what? I don't, I'm not sure if I'm getting this. It took me, as I say, 30 pages, but once I realised kind of what the tone was, um, I think because in my, in my head, whilst I was reading it, I was thinking, okay, it's 19th century Russian um, literature. I was thinking, you know, it's, it was going to be like that. And so I was reading it with that kind of, <laughs> with that kind of voice in my head. <laughs> but the tone of this is actually um, much more playful. It's much more kind of, um, uh, not wry, but sort of, um, but yeah, there's a kind of, there's a sort of a knowingness in the narration and, and yeah, kind of like a playfulness, which kind of makes the, the rhymes, the kind of what I thought were kind of clunky rhymes make more sense. Cause it's like, and so once I had that sort of voice in my head, then I, it really, I really started to enjoy it a lot more and I kind of, it started to go in, the information was sort of going in. So what is this about? So this is about love and it's about treat the people who love you with respect. So yes, we have Eugenie Onegin, um, who at the beginning of the book, he inherits this massive fortune. Um, and he's a bit of a fop and a bit of a kind of party goer and a bit of kind of like a... Um, but he gets very bored. He's sort of, yeah, he's just very sort of bored and kind of hedonistic and stuff. Um, but his his neighbour is called Lensky, who is another young man. And Lensky is in love with Olga, who's this very, very pretty, kind of like, nice, hello, sort of young girl. And her sister, stay with me, her sister is called Tatiana. Um, and she's kind of like the opposite of Olga. She's... She's, she is kind of, she's handsome, but she's very kind of demure and kind of very kind of like... When Eugene, when Eugene, Eugene meets her, um, he's kind of like, like a little bit sort of flirty with her. And people around are like, ooh, look at them, they're, they're going to be an item, are they? Ooh, look, ooh. Um, and Tatiana kind of um, senses this and she falls in love with Eugene in a big way. She kind of like, she falls hard for him. And she does a very brave thing. She writes him a very kind of open, honest um, love letter. Eugene, he doesn't, he doesn't fancy her in this, in that kind of way. And he basically, he, he meets up with her, and he basically says, "Thank you for your love letter. Um, I don't uh, feel the same way, but I appreciate <laughs> what you did." Um, but then he then sort of very patronisingly says, "Maybe don't, you know." be so thingy bob in future and Tatiana is like uh, and yeah I've I've definitely been in that situation where I've sort of where I've, where I've thought you know oh I'll, I'll just be honest I'll just be honest and say you know I fancy you and then the person has been like um I think we should just be friends <laughs> and I'm like ah. and then the the story kind of heats up from there and and things kind of go very very wrong so there's um so I did really, really like this. Um, there is a very, 
the, there's there's a duel, a kind of a um, a pivotal duel in this, which I thought was a bit stupid. <laughs> well, not stupid, but I, I just thought like the um, the reasoning for the duel and yeah, it was just everything everything kind of being blown out of proportion, um, which I guess is the point, I suppose. Um, I loved. There's a kind of um, to be all Aristotle about it. There is a great reversal at the end of this, which I really loved. It's kind of like a well, you should have, you should have, you shoulda, 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 sort of thing at the end, and I love that. And the rhymes, I mean, like the, don't let the verse stuff um, put you off, because they are kind of fun, <laughs> kind of like fun rhymes. This is the thing about translated stuff, like I've no idea how anyone can translate, speaking as a Brit, I don't know how anyone can translate Shakespeare into another language, it's just like the... It just must be so difficult. <laughs> and it's the same with this. It's kind of like, how does anyone translate 19th century Russian verse into kind of similar English? It just, yeah. Um, so I'd be interested to read another translation of this. I have heard that this is a good one, this one. Um, but yeah, I'd be interested to read another one just to see how someone else approaches it. But yes, no. A good one. Recommended. Don't think... It's not, uh, 19th century Russian. It's kind of like, oh, 19th century Russian. Okay, next. So, I read this book, You, You, by Nula Ni Krahur. I think that's how you pronounce it. Um, right, so this is an Irish novel. It's a debut novel um, from... When was it published? It was published in... 2010. So this is part of my Novels in the Second Portion project, um, and I've had this on my TBR for a very long time, and I thought, you know, it's very short, let's just, let's just do it. Right, so what is this? This is a, it's a white working class alcoholic parent trauma narrative. Remind you of anybody? You is a, a young girl, I think she's 10, she lives with her single mother, who is an alcoholic, um, and her two younger brothers, one is kind of around seven or six or seven, I believe, and then there's a much younger baby, much younger baby, a baby. And yeah, the first half of the book is basically this very um, miserable and kind of alcoholic parent trauma narrative thing going on, and I found it really stressful. I think I've got Shuggy Bane to read, and I'm just a bit nervous about Shuggy Bane, because I'm just like, I'm not, I'm not really a fan of this kind of um everything kind of so bleak and um and yet there's certain th it's interesting the kind of things that kind of for want of a better word like trigger us off you know like and for me kind of um novels about toxic family relationships and particularly kind of um novels with predatory um family members kind of really kind of make me go <laughs> then in the middle of the book um a tragedy occurs um, a really sort of heartbreaking tragedy occurs, and this kind of makes the mother completely sort of mentally collapse. And it kind of spurs this um, young girl to kind of take things into her own hands. And I really liked, I much preferred the second half to the first half because of that. Because, you know, finally she was sort of taking a, a control over her life. Even though it was kind of, it's not a sort of misguided decision, it's still kind of like her decision, if you know what I mean. So... Yes, and the second person, it's definitely, it definitely kind of puts you, that's the thing about kind of legit second person novels like this, where it is kind of legit second person, where you as the reader are kind of being put into the shoes, you're being, you're being put directly into that situation. And I think that's why the first half of this book, which has all these kind of um, traumatic and kind of abusive bits in it, is so kind of difficult to read for me. Um... But, uh, and like the narrative style is quite sort of direct and sort of blunt. If you're interested in second person, particularly kind of um, legit second person, then, um, and maybe you liked Shuggy Bane or something like that, um, then I'd recommend this. Um, and if you're sort of put off by how it sort of sounds, sort of the alcoholic parent trauma narrative, it does get, it's not kind of so, so, so bleak. There is kind of hope in it. Um, so yes, you. Next! So we have um, a bit of a major kind of backlist book. 
Uh, we have The Name of the Rose by, uh, by Umberto Eco. Right, so this is fabulous, isn't it? This is really, really fabulous. Um, so this is kind of like a historical fiction mystery, um, murder mystery novel about who is murdering all the monks. It's set in an Italian, it's set in the 14th century in an Italian abbey. Um, and yes, yeah, so there's this young monk called Adzo, who's like a novice, and he um, is travelling along with his master, um, William, and it's a bit of a complicated um, backstory, but basically they they go to this um, they go to this kind of remote mountain abbey, um, and for reasons. And whilst there, they learn that um, a monk has has died. And yes, and then kind of as things kind of progress, more monks start to get killed, and it's like, oh, what's going on? And um, and also it's kind of revealed that it might have something to do with the scary library. So uh, the abbey kind of revolves around this library, which is on the top floor of this tower, and um, and no one's allowed up there apart from the librarian in in the day. Um, but at night, you can you can get to it via the Assyrium, and um, and the Assyrium is kind of like this underground grave with lots of skeletons in it. So you have to go through that so in order to get up to the, the scary library. And why is the library the scary library? Well, it's um, <laughs> it's kind of nicknamed the Labyrinth as well. Because even though it's only on one floor of this tower, it's made up of um, a bunch of these kind of interlocking rooms, um, which have kind of different number of doors, and it's kind of very, very easy to, to get disorientated up there. Um, and plus, you know, it's kind of all, there's lots of kind of, not booby traps, but there's kind of stuff that makes you kind of go, Aah! So that's kind of the exciting, the exciting kind of mystery plot. Um, surrounding that is a very uh, complicated, very sort of dense amount of historical politics going on. So all of that stuff, this is not an easy book. This is not an easy book to read because of the very, very dense history stuff. Um, surrounding it and politics stuff surrounding it. But, I mean, I wouldn't let that put you off um, because even when there are bits which are the kind of the politic history bits, um, they don't really last long. There's always kind of like something kind of ten pages away. You're always sort of ten pages away from something exciting happening. Um, or something sort of scary happening. So you also have kind of very kind of philosophical um, theological um, arguments and discussions in it as well, which kind of bulk up <laughs> the novel. Um, and kind of the main one which I found really, really interesting was this thing about, like, the biggest threat to religion, or re the biggest threat to religion's kind of power, um, or kind of religion's influence, is not so much science, um, but satire. So yeah, definitely. If you haven't read it, then definitely, rec I definitely recommend it. It's um, it's really, really fabulous. Um, and yeah, it's very gripping. There's bits which are very, very scary. I haven't seen the um, the film. Um, the only thing about this book, um, which I didn't, it's not a criticism, but I just critiqued him. But I did like, I was like, oh. So there is kind of a bit in the middle where so the the theme of um, women and kind of how women are treated. I did look at the synopsis of the film because I wanted to see how it kind of differed. And um, yeah, the woman in this, in the film, she kind of gets a Hollywood ending, but in this, there are no Hollywood endings for women in 14th century Italy, um, particularly kind of, you know, peasant women. So yeah, I was a bit like, oh, but it's kind of, it sort of make, it makes sense and it's sort of, it's kind of, um, it makes a point in this book, but even so, the point is like, uh. But yes, no, definitely read it if you have not read it, because it's fabulous, and I really liked it. I think it's going to be one of my favourites of the year. Well, certainly of this half of the year, definitely. Okay, and then I read a very short, um, weird kind of novel. I read, um, By Grand Central Station I Sat Down and Wept by Elizabeth Smart. So this was part of a another bundle of books that Katie that Kieran from Katie Books uh, sent me, 
so yes, I'm I'm very much indebted to uh, Kieran. I'm going to try and sort of work out kind of what I can send you in return. But um, but yes, yeah, so uh, so this is a weird one. It's a it's more or less a kind of novella. It's not very long. Um, it's a very very kind of abstract poetic um, look at um, love and um, a kind of like a despairing uh, type of love. So it's kind of autofiction from what I understand. Um, and yeah, it kind of, it's about this woman who um, falls in love with this married man and they have this affair. And um, yeah, it's about her sort of overwhelming kind of despairing love for this guy. Basically. So yeah, so in terms of style, this kind of, this reminded me, oh, I've got a sneeze coming. <coughs> Gesundheit. So yeah, so it kind of reminded me in style of The Waves by Virginia Woolf, sort of, just in the way the, in the way of its kind of like really abstract, kaleidoscopic um, metaphors and images and, um, and yeah, all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, I think... I think if you're going to read this book, I think it doesn't. I think it. I think it helps. It it doesn't hurt uh, reading up on Elizabeth Smart's own backstory, particularly with, um, what's the guy? Is it George ba George Barker? Yes, yeah, so the novel's sort of based around that, and I think it's it's worth sort of like having a look at at her own backstory, because it doesn't sort of spoil anything. It it, it does kind of, but it sort of gives you a bit of context because it's so abstract and so kind of like. Oh, da, da, da. Yeah, so I can't say I was sort of completely gripped by it. It's it was written in nineteen forty five, and I mean just the the kind of intensity of like I haven't really been in love with someone sort of like like this for a long time where I'm like ah, um, <laughs> but I think if I the next time I am, um, I think this might be worth <laughs> reading again because it's kind of. I think it does encapsulate just that kind of despairing um, woe is me, I'm in love and everything's destroyed type thing, which is why I'm sort of, why I sort of, I'm reminded of The Waves by Virginia Woolf because it has characters in it which are like, everything is lost, oh she kissed me, everything is lost. Um, and it's sort of similar with this um, a little bit. So yes, an interesting one, a very interesting one, an interesting out of ten I would give it. <laughs> Um, yeah, have a go. If you want sort of poetic fiction, um, yeah, but as I say, it's it might be worth sort of reading up on her backstory um, before you read it. So let's do one more. Let's do one more on this run and then, um, and then yes, because I do want to talk about this book. So, um, so next up I read Beloved by Toni Morrison. <gasps> so this Beloved by Toni Morrison. So this is kind of, from what I understand, this is kind of like the big one in terms of Toni Morrison, I think. Um, I mean, she has a bunch of big ones, <laughs> um, like Song of Solomon, Bluest Eye, what are the other ones? Yeah, she has a, sort of like a bunch of kind of big hitter cultural reset books. Um, but I mean, this one, I think it won the Pulitzer. This cover, this cover is a bit worrying. Um, yeah, it's a bit worrying, particularly having read the book. Um, but yeah, there we go. And this is another one of um, this is another one that Kate, uh, Katie books that Kieran, sorry, uh, uh, gifted to me, which I was very grateful for. I'm indebted to you. So what is this about? So this essentially is about the your sins of your past coming back to haunt you, um, quite literally. The initial setup is Seth and her daughter Denver are living in this house. Um, which is haunted by the ghost of uh, Seth's baby daughter, Beloved. So being haunted by a ghost is one thing. It's, com it's another thing being haunted by a child ghost, as we all know from horror movies. It's another thing being haunted by a baby ghost. And it's a completely different ballgame to be haunted by a baby ghost who has been wronged. Um, and that's, that's kind of what is happening with um, Seth, and Den and Seth and Denver. Until in comes Paul D, who um, Seth has escaped slavery, um, sort of eighteen years prior, and uh, Paul D was kind of at the same 
uh, farm where they were slaves, and he's also escaped. Um, and he arrives, and he sees that the house is haunted, and he kind of he he does something about it, and that's kind of like the inciting incident um, of the book, and that's where things sort of take things sort of carry on. So right, so yes, yeah, so this is this is historical fiction. So this is set kind of late nineteenth um, century. Um, or like 1870s, I think, um, where slavery is still a thing, and yes, yeah, Seth and Paul D have escaped this um, this farm where initially things they were sort of treated, you know, as sort of as best as slaves can be treated. Um, but then this um, this new guy arrives, um, who they call the school teacher, and yeah, they kind of the things that they face are kind of like some of the worst sort of barbaric things that slaves had to face. And yeah, and the book, I mean, it's really, it's just so, it's just very, very powerful. Again, it's about this thing about the sins of your past coming back to haunt you, um, and sort of how guilt and um, regrets and things can really kind of overwhelm and sort of overpower your whole day-to-day -day life. Yeah, so it's just, it's, I just thought it was absolutely outstanding. I thought it was outstanding, I thought this, this book was. Um, there are bits in it which are really hard to read. There are bits which are, it's just, Toni Morrison, it's just sentence by sentence, isn't it? It's sentence by sentence. It's just, it's just fabulous. And I loved the ending. I loved, I loved everything apart from this cover. <laughs> I loved everything. Um, yeah. A masterpiece. A masterpiece. Um, I don't think it's um, thing about to say that. I thoroughly recommend it if you haven't read it before. It is tough to read, a lot of it, but um, it's very, very gripping and it's very... Um, how do you describe Toby Morrison's writing? Just, just sentence by sentence wowzers, basically. So there we go. <laughs> Okay, last three books, and they're all kind of like. Aah. So the another book that oh, this video is kind of brought to you by Kieran at Katie Books um, this month, but um, but another book that he uh, he gave me was this, The Story of the Eye, by uh, George Bataille. Is it how you pronounce it, George Bataille? Uh, right. So I saw his review, and I saw, and I kind of had a little a YouTube kind of binge of watching. Uh, people talk about this book, and I was a bit nervous to read it, but I did read it, and um, sort of warning for performative reading coming up, but I did um, kind of do some live reactions as I was reading it on my Instagram stories, and here's how that went down. So I have a couple of hours free this Sunday afternoon, so I'm going to read Story of the Eye. It's 70 pages of transgressive eroticism, I'm going to hate it. So already, I mean, the first chapter is pretty grim already. So uh, yes, we're actually doing this and it's going to get worse. So, uh... <laughs> okay, this bit did make me laugh. So they've just done an act with an egg and, uh, <laughs> and her mother um, is, is there watching them like, and uh, Simone says, pretend there's no one there. So there's a lot of weeing in this. <laughs> um, also, we are getting to some serious egg action, so um, whoop de doo I guess. So we are halfway through, I think. Um, we have our first death, which, um, of, and of course, subsequent weeing, <laughs> um, of course, is taking place. And um, we have a new... I've just finished a chapter where there is a new development. Um, Simone has a new... A new need and I'm like oh no. Okay so we've come to the blasphemous section um, I can see that um, the chapter I'm about to read is involving this priest again and I'm a bit nervous to say the least. Ah! <laughs> Shitting out. Okay, so um if you go to a if you go to a modern art gallery, very often um 
one of the things you might hear from the people that are there is why is that why is that art why is that meant to what is that meant to be why is that art what what's the point in that anyone could do that what's the point in that and my response to that has always been someone has to do it in order for it to be done and therefore and then it's done and then we can move on sort of thing so someone has to do a lobster phone in order for it to be done and then we can go oh look a lobster phone okay an unmade bed someone has to do an unmade bed someone has to do a scribble on a piece of paper and hang out you know all these sorts of things i mean that politics of how art is valued aside um but you know someone has to do it in order for it to be done and then it's done um and we can move on move moving on with the understanding of what that of what that has done what that looks like and then other artists can you know rip riff off it and say well what if what if we do this what if we do that blah, blah, blah. so that's kind of been my justification for why you know a, ur a urinal is um displayed in an art gallery or whatever or a dot you know and the temptation for me to be all judgy Jason about this um, is quite strong. So, like, so the basic story is: a young man gets into a into a uh, young man gets into a relationship with a young woman called Simone. Um, their kind of sexual um, proclivities get um, more and more sadistic and more gross, and it kind of all culminates to this um, climactic scene, which uh, it's kind of like a a sort of sacrilegious rape, murder, body horror scene, basically. And um, yes, it is disturbing and it is kind of like a bit gross and a bit like, ah! But I was just like, well, all right. And yeah, I was kind of thinking, well, what's the point? But my response to that other thing can be, can be given to this, because if you think about it, <laughs> in art, yes, we're going there, in art, um, artists have depicted hell and depicted the id for as long as kind of people have been people, really. And um, and yes, yeah, someone has to go into someone has to go into the kind of base, explore the base um, sexual fantasies um, in order for it to be done, and then we can. And then we can read it or see it and sort of move on with the understanding of what that looks like and what that feels like. But, you know, that's completely valid. It's completely valid to want to push the boundaries and to push the um, to push the envelope and to try and, yeah, to really try and mine, mine the, the nasty sides of our human nature. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. It's not required reading as far as I'm concerned, you know, it's, you know, just, you know, it's, it's there if you want to, if you want to see it. But, um... But yes, um, I read it. <laughs> I'm sort of I'm sort of torn between thinking, oh, it's just someone going, oh, and then this happens, and this, and then this happens, oh, and then this might happen. Um, I'm torn between just thinking that and then thinking, well, no, it is. It's completely, you know, we need we need to to uh, explore the the nasty <laughs> the nasty sides of our of our psyche, you know. And as I say, it's not required reading by any by any means, but. Um, it's there if you want it. <laughs> so there. Okay. So next up, I read Detransition Bebe by Tori Peters. Um, it's a hardback. Look, a hardback. I, I bought a hardback. Um, and why did I buy the hardback? Well, because I was very much interested in it. And I wanted to... People have been talking about this novel for a little bit. And I was like, I want to know what's what's going on. So, right, okay, so this book tested me. It tested me so much. It's, I think it's fabulous. I think it's really, really fabulous, but it did test me and it did sort of challenge my my tolerance levels, I guess. <laughs> okay, so trying to describe what this book is about. So, so all this happens in the first 50 pages, just so you're aware, but um, there's no kind of basic plot with this. So essentially we have, the novel focuses on three characters, but we... Um, it's told from the perspective of two of them. So we follow Reese and Ames, who are ex-lovers. Reese is a trans woman, and Ames has detransitioned from being a trans woman to to male, or at least male presenting, 
don't worry about it. It's in the book. It's complicated. Um, but yeah, essentially he's detransitioned from a trans woman to a man, and yeah, um, and then they're, they're ex lovers. So Ames um, enters into a relationship with Katrina, who is his boss at work. Katrina is a cis woman, and um, Ames thought that he was sterile. He thought that the hormones that he took as a trans woman um, made him sterile, but he ends up getting Katrina pregnant. So yeah, Ames really wants to be with Katrina. He really loves her. He wants to kind of stay with her. But if she's going to keep the baby, um, he doesn't want to be seen... He doesn't want to be the father. It's complicated. Um, he has sort of a deep discomfort about being the father, but he's... So his thinking is, well, I can co-parent, and if I get um, Reese, my my ex, uh, Reese really, really wants to be a mother. She has always, always wanted to have a child, and she's, you know, on the other side of 30, and, you know, it's kind of like, as a trans woman, how on earth am I going to ever have a, have a baby and be a mother? So Ames thinks, oh, well, I can... I can uh, satisfy, I can make everyone happy. I can make Katrina happy because she's not going to be on her own. Um, she's going to have two other people supporting her, bringing up this child. Um, and I can make Reese happy because she's always wanted to be a mother and now she has the chance and stuff. And and then I will feel, I will feel much more comfortable and everything will be okay. <sighs> so he presents this um, suggestion to Katrina and Reese separately. And they sort of quite understandably say, like both of them say, like, you're a sociopath and this is a terrible idea and no, we're not going to do that. And I was like, yeah, end of book, end of book. Yeah, I, I agree, end of book. <laughs> but um, but that's only like 50 pages in. And I was like, we still have, we still have 300 pages to go. So why, what's happening? So a very convenient, I mean, convenient, I mean, stranger things have happened in real life, but a sort of convenience of circumstances means that Katrina, who is the one who is pregnant, um, sort of starts to consider that this might be, she starts to be open that this might be a good idea. And so the novel is basically um, then uh, them trying to work out what this, this uh, prospective um, triad parenting situation would mean. And why is it so... why did it make me uncomfortable at times? Well, so recent aims, and Katrina, but recent aims are very, very complex, very flawed, damaged, and just extremely... and and selfish and, and stuff, and, and also likeable and stuff, but they're very, very complex people with very a very deep, complex past. And the book also kind of flits between um, these kind of flashback chapters, where we see uh, when Ames was Amy, and they were in this relationship, and we see kind of the ways in which they betrayed each other. And Katrina isn't off the hook either. I mean, I was kind of... the one thing that made me uncomfortable was this... because she is the one who is pregnant. Um, yeah, the thing that sort of made me uncomfortable was kind of the discussions around her, and there's a fabulous chapter when they're in a... A hotel lobby having a discussion about certain things and about so yeah recent and Katrina basically have this kind of this thing about who has got the most to lose out of this scenario um which I thought was just really really fascinating and, and just like and there's a lot of moments like that where it kind of you know mind blown sort of thing so yeah so I it, it did make me uncomfortable but towards the end when I sort of realized kind of where this was going I was like all oh, this book is really amazing because it is about unlikable people and it is about people trying to justify the bad things that they they do to each other and as I say Katrina isn't off the hook she kind of betrays the others and, and stuff and she kind of gets things wrong um but yeah it's about these <laughs> it's about these three characters who just are trying their best um but are failing so yeah it is about queerness and about motherhood and about um uh, about sort of our past trauma making us um misjudge certain decisions that we make towards other people and it's just very very complex and very funny as well but very very 
yeah, I think it just really, it made me uncomfortable in a way that I had to really interrogate with myself why, what about it was making me uncomfortable. Um, and once I kind of realised kind of what Tory Peters was doing, then I was just like... And last of all, but by no means least, this is fabulous. So I read Open Water. So this is by Caleb Azuma Nelson. So this is a, um, this was a real kind of uh, impulse buy, impulse purchase. Um, I can't remember who I saw talking about this book, but I, someone said that it was in the second person. So I was like, oh, a new release that's in the second person. So I was like, oh, okay, let's, let's get it. And turns out this is kind of one of the most important books that I've read for a very, very, very long time. So first of all, I mean, it's, it's a very short novel. It's only 160 pages. This edition, it's kind of very kind of unusual edition. It's got kind of, um, I think the word is d dappled, doppled, dappled edges. Duff, doffled, daffled, that, that thing. So essentially, this is a love story. And it's a love story that is kind of well trodden territory. Um, so it's like the boy meets girl, girl is already in a relationship, they realise that they're kind of got the hots for each other, they enter a very kind of deep intimate friendship but they both know that once they kind of cross the line that this friendship will be broken and so they'll be, yeah, it's about, you know, when, it, when are they going to cross the line into being together sort of thing. Fairly familial, familial territory. However, so I think this book is really kind of imperative and 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 amazing. So first of all, I mean the writing itself is gorgeous. It's really it's just amazing. It's powerful. But I mean the context around it. So this um so the you in the story is a young black man living in London. Yes, the central the central thing of this story is this is this love story and it's this thing about he doesn't really want her to he's he's he has a fear of her actually sort of seeing him seeing him truly because um being seen as a black man in you know in london or in the uk um doesn't really happen you're seen particularly by police as kind of other and as um yeah, it's not not a person basically, and then now he's in this situation where this woman is kind of seeing him, and it kind of brings up all this stuff. So yeah, it really goes there. This is a book about blackness. It's about maleness, and about um, Londonness, and yeah, it's just it's really fabulous. Also, this is kind of um, a kind of a tribute to black art as well. Um, so there's tons and tons of references to different um, artists who have kind of centred or um, depicted the black experience or black bodies. So like um, musicians and painters and writers, Zadie Smith makes a actually makes an appearance in this. So I don't really know how to put this, but I I feel like something clicked when I read this novel and I don't want to I'm not saying that I I now fully I, I fully understand what it is to be black and British a black British man in the UK no I don't of course I don't but I feel like I kind of understand a bit better having read this book um it's yeah I just I can't stress how phenomenal I, I phenomenal I thought this book was um whilst also being this gorgeous 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 love story um at the heart of it um, it's really, really moving. I got really, really moved by it, and I would really, really recommend it. Um, I think possibly, maybe it was the second person that that sort of did it. You know, to sort of be in the in the shoes of of this character. I don't know if I'm sort of I'm. I don't know if I'm explaining myself very well or doing a good job in describing what this book is like. But I, I, I really, I really recommend it, and I just thought it was phenomenal and amazing, and I would very much recommend it. So yes, open water. It is fabulous. So there we go. Um, yeah, ten books. Oh, flipping neck. Um, so yes, thank you so much for watching. If you have been watching, it's been a. This is a long one. Um, yes, do. Uh, oh, hello. Yes, uh, do look after yourselves and be kind to each other. Be kind to animals.
And um, yes, I shall hopefully see you next month. So bye bye. <laughs>